It's hard to know when you're on the wrong path. You're just dealing with obstacles in front of you. You want to do the right thing. Sometimes you just don't know the right way to go. It's been difficult for the last 15 years uh, raising our children. Uh, we had a lot of obstacles we had to overcome. Uh, watching them struggle, making decisions we knew would uh, have serious consequences. The situation got really bad over time and it started to break the family apart. We didn't know how to handle this and we almost looked the other way. There were stretches of time over the course of about 12 years that we wouldn't have a relationship at all with our daughter. Our neighbor suggested we visit the loft and listening to the sermons every Sunday opened up a, a whole new world for us and things started to shift. We went one Sunday. The first thing he started to talk about was forgiveness. It felt like nobody else, nobody was in the room except us. He was talking directly to me and directly to my wife. I did not hear anything except his voice. I knew right then and there it was about our daughter. And that if we wanted to have a relationship with her, we had to do something. We both looked at each other and said, today's the day. Ron made the call. And normally she wouldn't answer because, you know, what now? What do they want now? But she answered. We told her about how the Lord was working in our lives and that we loved her and we wanted to forgive her and asked her to forgive us and could we please have a relationship and make things better. And she said yes. She said yes. I watched my wife pray every day for our children and I started seeing changes. Probably two or three weeks later, I'm in a car. Uh, it was my daughter, and so I found a place to park because she asked me, was I sitting down? And I said, yes, and she said, well, I have news for you. She told me that she had opened her heart to Christ. What a gift. forgiveness that we had shown each other paved this beautiful way for God to come into her heart. And uh, I've, I've got my little girl back. To see God's Word work in our lives, to make our path straight, to realize that Christ is our guide on this journey, helping us to go in the way we should go. Forgiving and being forgiven opens the heart to unconditional love which can transform lives, and it certainly has for us. Amen. What does Easter say to people and families who are broken? What does Easter say to people who feel lost and alone? What does Easter say to people who struggle to find their way in this world? Easter tells us there is a God. There is a God who knows us. There is a God who cares about us and our families. There is a God who is still alive, still at work in the world, still performing miracles, changing lives, healing families, and performing miracles. Easter tells us that there's no power on earth, not our past, not our mistakes, not our sins. Easter tells us there's no power on earth, not even a cross, not even a tomb that can defeat God's plans for us if we will come to him with humility and faith. We all struggle in life. We all get lost at some point. That's what you heard Ron say in that video. He was on the wrong path. He wanted to do the right things, but he didn't know what direction to go. All of us at some point end up there. All of us get lost. Sometimes we get lost in life because of the pain that we suffer. 
We experience some terrible tragedy. We are the victim of some terrible injustice. Someone that we love is hurting and we can't make their lives better. Maybe it's a spouse who's dying much too soon or a child who's addicted to drugs or has an eating disorder. And everything we try, nothing works. It's so easy over time to become angry and bitter or guilty and ashamed. It's so easy to give up and shut down, close down emotionally and spiritually, push everyone away, even God. We wander through life, going through the motions, but the truth is we are hurting and lost inside. Sometimes we get lost because of the lies that we're told and we believe. Sometimes it's a lie about who you are. Growing up, maybe you were told that you were different, that there was something wrong with you, something that made you unwanted and unworthy, something that if other people were to ever see, they would reject you and condemn you. And so you've learned to hide your true self. You've learned to keep your true self in the shadows, lost from others, maybe now lost from you. Sometimes it's a lie about who God is. Some people grow up being told that God is a harsh and angry judge who can't be pleased. Some people are given the message that God is far off and distant, unconcerned about their lives. Others are given a picture of God that his love is reserved only for select few who do enough or good enough, religious enough, certainly not for someone like you. Let me just say, if any pastor or priest has ever made you feel unworthy... If any religion has ever told you that God is not concerned about you in your life, my heart hurts for you. God's heart hurts for you. That's not who you are. That's not who God is. It is a lie sent by the enemy to separate you from God, to make you lost in this world, and you reject that lie. Many people, though, live with it, never recognize it for what it is, and they get lost. Sometimes we get lost in life because of the wrong decisions we make. Isaiah tells us in his prophecy, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. It seems to be human nature that we think we're going to step into the fullness of life by going our own way, calling our own shots, doing our own thing, in essence, becoming our own gods. Instead of turning to the one who knows us, who created us, who knows what brings life, who wants life for us. And when we go our way instead of God's way, we get lost from him. The truth is we get lost from everything that's good. People, all of us, at some time in our lives, we get lost. Maybe you're there now. If you're lost, even in some little part of your life, I got really good news for you today. This is your day. Easter is your day, because Easter tells us how to come out of the darkness, how to get on the right path, and how to step into the fullness of life. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote about the death and the resurrection of Jesus in the first chapter of Romans. He said, the good news is about his son, Jesus. In his earthly life, he was born into King David's family line. But when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was shown to be the son of God. So what Paul says here is that when Jesus was raised from death to life, this was God saying, this one is my son. This one has been with me from the beginning. This one knows my heart. You can trust everything that Jesus has told you about me because he knows me like no one else. And what did Jesus teach us about God? That he has a kind and compassionate heart that he loves us and that he wants to bring good into our lives. In Matthew chapter seven, Jesus said, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Now, Jesus here is not saying that people are as evil as they could be. He's simply contrasting our nature with the nature of God. And he says what we all know to be true, that we human beings, we have a self-centered nature. We tend to be self-protective. Our first thought is almost always me first. And Jesus says, even given that, you find joy in bringing good gifts into the lives of your children. You find it easy to give good things to your children. He says, now let me tell you about one in whom there is no self-centeredness, no need for self-protection. He is God 
And he loves you the way that a good father loves his children, only with more purity and passion, more patience and perseverance. His heart is a kind heart, it's a tender heart. His heart is at the heart of the universe and at the heart of the universe there is grace. And God wants to bring what is good into your life. Now, many of us had a good, encouraging, helpful father growing up. Some of you may not have. And so when you hear that God is like a father, it's hard for you to relate. If that's you, please hear me. God is not the father you had. God is the father you deserve. God is the father you've always dreamed of. One who holds you dear. One who is affectionate and kind towards you. One who wants to protect you and help you and encourage you and bring good things into your life. That's what Jesus taught. The heart of the universe, there is a heart of grace and it is open to you. Now because God's heart is a heart of grace, I want to tell you three great truths that I hope you'll go home with. The first is this, there is grace for you. So forget the lies, here's the truth. God created you because he wanted you. God created you because he wanted to be in a relationship with you. God created you because he wanted to be in a love relationship with you where he could pour out his love, he could pour out his grace, he could bring good gifts into your life. So that means the truest truth about you is this, you are loved. Not what someone did to you, not the mistakes you've made, not whatever curse someone has put on you by their actions or their words, not some yoke that you've labored under. The truest truth about you is this, you are greatly loved. That should be the foundation of your life. That should be the truth you stand on. That should be the truth that you walk in. You are deeply loved by God. I had several years ago, I would say an epiphany of sorts. It began when Peggy and I had our first child, Stephen. I can still remember as years ago, but when the nurse put that little baby in my hands, I felt something I'd never felt before. It, it was a different kind of love than I had ever known. And I loved my mom and my dad. I loved my brother and my sister. I had loved my friends. I loved my wife dearly, but this was a different kind of love. I think with all of them, somehow I expected them to love me back, do something for me. That was kind of part of the deal. But when Stephen was put in my hands, there were no expectations, no wants. All the love was just going this way. I loved him not because of what he had done for me or what he might do for me. I loved him simply because he was mine. That's all. He was mine. A few years passed, his brother came along, Ian, and a few more years passed, and I remember one day we were working out in the yard, and not, um, not surprisingly, neither of them was really committed to the work that we were doing. That's just the truth of it. I remember I said to him, boys, why, why does it feel like I'm doing all the working and you're doing all the watching? And my younger son says, I don't know, because we're not watching, okay? <laughs> He's probably six years old at the time. <laughs> and so we went, we went back into the house. And even though they hadn't done everything that I wanted them to, I just had this feeling like it is so good to have these boys in my life. I just, I find such joy in being around them and seeing their faces and hearing them talk and watch what they do. It just feels so good to love them. They mean so much to me. Then I had this really strange thought. I thought, is it possible that my father loves me the way I love them? That I matter to him the way they matter to me? My first thought was, that's crazy. There's no way he could love me like that. There's no way he could feel that way about me. And then I thought, what's crazy is thinking that my love is somehow special or unique as a father. He might. He must feel this way about me. And I thought if it's true that being around me and seeing me and hearing my voice and feeling my hugs brings him as much joy as when my sons do all that for me, I need to call more often. I know you to go see him more often. And then I had another thought. Is it possible that God loves me like this? 
That was really crazy. I, I mean, that God would love me the way that I love my boys and want good for me the way that I want it for my sons. I mean, now God could have set up any kind of relationship with us that he wanted. God could have made me his servant, and I guess I am, and that's a great privilege. And God could have made me his employee, and that would have been cool, and I guess I am. You know, technically, I work for God. But uh, either one of those would have been great. But the Bible says, but as many as received him, Jesus, he gave them the right to become the sons and the daughters of God. And I thought, he must love me the way that I love my sons. Not because I've done anything, but just because there's love in his heart for me. And that epiphany, that changes everything. That means that the hurts that you suffer, God's not the cause of that. God's not the author of evil. God is the one that you can go to with those hurts. He's the one who cries with you. He's the one that wipes your tears away. He's the one that puts his arms around you and says, we're going to get through this together. I'll go through it with you. And the lies that you've been told, that you're unworthy, that he's far off and distant, all of a sudden those just go away because you know he is a gracious and good and loving father. He loves you dearly. And then the wrongs that we do, the decisions we make that cause us to wonder what good gift could God give us in those moments? He gave us the greatest gift of all. He gave us Jesus to come into the world to bear the penalty for our sins so that we might be forgiven and restored to a right relationship with him. Again, from the prophecy of Isaiah, he, predicting the coming of Jesus, he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors, for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. God could not overlook the wrongs that we did, but he could forgive them. God could not act like they mattered, but they could matter so much to him that in the person of Jesus, he would come into the world, bear our penalty, pay a price that we could never pay so that we might be forgiven, so we might be cleansed, so we might start over, and so our relationship with him would be restored and made right again. God has a gracious heart, however we've gotten lost. God knows all the wrongs you've done. God knows the things you've done that have made you feel ashamed and guilty. God knows the things that when you look back on them, it brings so much pain to your consciousness that you scream out inside, trying to drown out those accusatory voices. God knows all of that, and still he loves you. The truest truth about you is this. You are greatly loved by God, and he wants you to come home to him. That's what the Van Morricks experienced, right? Not church people, not really believers, not seeking God, and yet they discovered that God had been waiting for them all their lives not to condemn, not to punish, but to accept, to forgive, to restore, and to make them and their family right again. Now, why do people not receive this grace? Two primary reasons. God offers it to everyone. One is we think we don't need it. The other, we think we are unworthy of it. We're undeserving. So you saw the Van Morick story. I'm going to show you some of the backstory with their daughter, Maureen, that they were trying to reestablish a relationship with. This is her talking about her life before she came to faith in Christ. Let's watch. Well, I had a friend who would go to these Bible studies um, at, once a week and kept trying to get me to go. And I was like, you know, God's just, I'm not, God and I just don't, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I, I got this on my own. And a few days later, I was feeling very, very alone, very depressed. And like there was nobody, nobody that could help me out of this despair. You see where we are, we human beings, we're so strange. One moment we're saying, I got this, I don't need anybody else. The next moment we are in despair. And both of those will keep us from accepting God's grace. And let me tell you that if you're at that place, I've got this, I don't need anybody's help. Let me just call it what it is, it's pride. And if you think that you don't need God's grace and help to get through life to live it well, if you think that one day you're going to be able to stand before a holy God and say, I had that, 
I didn't need your mercy. I didn't need your grace. I didn't need your Jesus. I didn't need your cross. If you think you're going to be able to stand before a holy and righteous God clothed in your own good deeds, then let me just tell you, in love, you are in more danger than you know. You're more deeply loved than you imagine, but your pride has put you in a place of immense danger because ultimately it's pride only that will keep us from receiving God's grace. The other thing that can do it is feeling unworthy. I've made such a mistake of things. Nobody understands, nobody cares, not even God would reach down to the place where I am. Friends, let me tell you, grace is not given to the worthy. It's given to the needy. And if you're at that place where you're ready to humble your pride, if you're ready to say, God, I've kind of made a mess of things. I've been on the wrong path. I haven't been able to find my way, but I am ready to cry out to you. I believe that life is found in you. I believe that joy is found in you. I believe that forgiveness is found in what Christ did for me. Lord, do for me what I cannot do for myself. The promise is there is grace for you and that God will forgive your sins. He will cleanse your spirit and you can start over again in life. Some of you, I am certain, are here in that place. You want something. You know you need something. You are ready to say, I need grace. And if that's you, when we close up and I pray, I'll pray for you. And you can make that your prayer and you can receive this living Jesus that we're talking about this morning and it will make a huge difference in your life. Now, the second thing I want to tell you that I hope you go home with is this. It's grace that changes the human heart. So, I think that many people misunderstand the Christian faith. They think it's some kind of elaborate scheme that religious people have created because we know that we can't have any fun in life and we want to put enough rules on others that they're just as miserable as we are, right? <laughs> I think people really do believe that religion, that Christianity, that it's an attempt to control their behavior, but nothing could be further from the truth. The Christian faith is not an attempt to control your behavior. It's God's promise that he can change your heart. Now, let's be honest for just one minute. Many of us in this room, we have wanted to change. We have tried to change. We have worked to change, but we are unchanged. And the reason for that is we've changed the only thing we know how to change. We've tried to change our behaviors, our patterns. We've tried to change how we think. We've used our willpower to try to change our lives. But all the will can ever do is express what's in your heart. That's where real change occurs. Change occurs from the inside out. You cannot live a new life with an old heart. You cannot be a different person until your heart is changed. And nothing, nothing changes the human heart like grace, like God's grace given to you in Jesus. A friend of mine is a pastor in Pennsylvania. He has this doctorate, which was a real accomplishment because he grew up with a severe learning disability. It made life difficult for him and actually difficult for his parents. He felt rejected by the cool kids, really by all the kids, except the kids who would accept anyone as long as they brought along enough drugs. And he gravitated to that group. Created all kinds of problems for him and his family. His parents would find him using. They would ask him to stop, tell him to stop. He'd promise to stop. It's a promise that would be broken. They'd catch him again. They'd go through it again. He'd break it again. Rules would be set, broken, reset, rebroken. And all the time, he would see his parents, how disappointed they were in him. And it just made him angry and defiant inside. Many nights, he didn't come home. And his parents would go out late at night, early in the morning, sick of heart, worried. And they'd go out looking for him. And when he finally came home, there'd be that look on their face. And it just made him angrier, harder inside. They will not control me, not with those looks, not with their disappointment, not with their rules. They will not tell me who to be. He was arrested several times. Use of drugs, breaking and entering, burglary. Their family was torn apart. His parents were torn apart. Every time that he was arrested, his father would come and bail him out. Every time he'd see that look, every time he'd get angrier inside. The last time he was in jail, his father came for him. Bailed him out, 
And as they walked to the car, John said, I could see how weary and broken my father was. His shoulders were slumped, his head was down. He got into the driver's seat and shut the door. John went around the back of the car and sat in the back seat. And they sat in silence for what seemed like forever. His father looked up in the rearview mirror and said, John, what are you doing back there? He said, what do you think I'm doing? I'm waiting for you to start the car. Let's go. His father said, I won't do it. I won't do it. I will not start this car unless you get out of that seat and come sit here in the front beside me. You are my son. You will always be my son. The son's place is next to his father. John said that in his father's words, in that tender moment, he heard the voice of his heavenly father. And his pride was broken. His heart was changed, and his life was never again the same. What can change a human heart? Rules can't. Restrictions can't. The promise of a reward, the threat of punishment, none of those things can change the human heart. Willpower cannot change the human heart. Only grace. Only that grace that is given to us when we know we've done wrong when we know that we're undeserving, only that grace that every one of us needs, when it becomes real, our heart is changed. Does that make you perfect? No, but it will make you different. It will begin a life that will be different for you. Let's go back to Maureen's story, and let's look at the transformation that occurred in her life when she finally came to real faith in Christ and discovered how much God loved her. I would noticed something really different about her demeanor. And just, uh, just kind of overall, just a, a big difference, a big change in kind of how she, she acted. It, was, it wasn't anything I could really put a finger on. He kept but. staring at me, he kept smiling, these weird smiles. And finally, we're walking, and I keep, he keeps smiling at me. And I was like, why do you keep smiling at me? He, or, and he's like, well, there's something different about you. It's really good, but there's something different. And that's when I told him that I had found God. It, the transformation was instant. As soon as I accepted God and said, I'm yours, I'm giving me to you. The transformation was so instant. I felt this light just come over me, like from within and just burst out. And now like I'm living my life, I'm seeing things differently and it's pure, I mean, love and joy and, just smiles and happiness and my son it was like you he saw the transformation so fast and he's like you're so good now like it's all good and it was I can't I can't I mean it was a miracle from darkness to light from despair to joy from I've got this it's all good to mommy you're so good you're so good now It's all good. It's a miracle. Only grace can do that. I don't know what you carried in here with you today, but I know some of you carry some heavy things. Resentment, bitterness, anger, guilt, shame, regret, unforgiveness, critical spirit, anger, I know how hard that can make your life. I know how much pain that can create within a person. I know how heavy that is to bear. There's grace for you. I don't want you to carry that. The one who loves you much more than I do certainly does not. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. When I pray in just a moment, if you need God to change your heart, you say, God, I've tried, but it hasn't worked. I need, I need you to do for me what I cannot do. I'm going to give you an opportunity to lay that thing down at the foot of the cross where God's grace ran red so that it could be covered and taken from you and so that you could be set free. God's grace can. God's grace will do that. Here's the last thing I hope you take away with you. It's grace that makes life really good. 
Now, I'm going to tell you something that is not going to sound very manly, and it's going to get some of the guys mad at me here, but I like weddings. I, I know. I know that makes some of you guys want to rush up here and pull my man card, and I get that. <laughs> and I know that there's going to be a time when your wife now wants you to go to her cousin's wedding, and you say, I don't even know her. I don't want to go to that. And you say, well, Rob loves weddings. Maybe you should go. You'd start liking weddings. So I expect a lot of angry emails over the next few months. But I do, I like weddings, it's a good thing I like weddings because I go to so many. I personally have performed 530 weddings. One of my last ones is just right back here. And I, I've done this, I've done it in all kinds of settings, in mountains, lakes, chapels, churches. I did one on a tall ship in Galveston. I did one in a median in a street in Spring, Texas with cars going by and honking. The, the last one of note, was done, remember the cold spell we had in January? It hit 22 degrees. That same weekend, 39 degrees, I did this wedding outside, bridesmaids and bride in strapless gowns. The crowd was dressed like they were ready for a Green Bay Packers football game. <laughs> and the first time, 530, first time ever, when a bride and groom said, I do, I saw their breath. <laughs> I hope somebody got a picture, it'd be their wedding vows, frozen in time. So I, I, I like weddings, it's a good thing I do. And what I like most, it's not the music, the reception, the food, the dresses, the tuxes, all those things are great. It's not even the time that I get to spend with the groom and his buddies in the groom's room. Let me just tell you, this is a real treat. Uh, the two people who get the most nervous at a wedding, one, the father of the bride, because he's giving away his little girl and scares the heck out of him, and two, the groom. Because unlike the bride who has been putting a napkin on her head, walking down the hall since she was five years old, singing, here comes the bride, <laughs> this guy wakes up the day of his wedding and says, I'm getting married. How do I feel about this? <laughs> and let me just tell you, having his buds there to help him who are no more grown up than he is, it, well, there's a little saying, the difference between boys and government bonds is over time, bonds mature. And that is the perfect way of witnessing that. We walk, I lead him into the chapel and I think, oh, Lord Jesus, there's going to be a beautiful young woman in a white gown walk down that aisle and she's going to marry this 12-year-old in a tuxedo <laughs> and she has no idea what work is cut out for her. It's just the honest truth. But even more than that, there is a moment in just about every wedding where I am able to remember what I seem to forget so easily. There's a moment when life makes perfect sense. There's a moment when I ask myself, what is life about? And it's always answered right there. Life is about love. It's about the love that causes two people to commit themselves to living together forever. It's about the love of family that come and adore us on our big day. It's about the love that causes friends to travel, sometimes hundreds of miles, just to sit in a church pew with a smile that goes from ear to ear because they are so happy for us. It's about the love of one who is there unseen but more real than anyone who sits in that chapel, who has a gracious and loving heart, who loves to bring good gifts into the lives of his children. And so he has brought these two together, each one his gift to the other one. 530 weddings, 530 times I've said, what is life about? It's not about success. It's not about position or possessions or power. It's not about what other people think. It's, it's about grace. It's what makes life good. It's about the grace that's better to people than they deserve. It's about the grace that makes us kind to one another. It's the grace that allows us to forgive others and allows others to forgive us. It's about the grace that allows us to wipe the slate clean and start all over again. That moment, it always tells me what life is about. It's what makes life good. I'm going to show you one more video. This is when the Van Morks had one of those perfect moments, not at a wedding, but at a baptism. So you'll hear Jamie talk about their daughter um, being prepared to be baptized, and then Ron also being baptized at the same time. 
the baptisms were for my dad and my daughter were amazing. You know, first my dad getting baptized because his journey was long. You know, he, did, he I remember growing up, he didn't, he didn't know what to believe. And when my mom had told me, you know, dad's going to church, what? Dad has a Bible, he's read what? And you know, it just, it was really neat to see. And when he decided to get baptized, it's something, it's, it's something I won't forget. She was born right after we started watching the Loft sermons. And, uh, and then once we started watching that, we knew, you know, when she, when it was time, she was going to get baptized there. And, and so, you know, we'd had several conversations about, uh, about doing the baptism. And, uh, and so we had already planned that all out. And then it was my birthday on the day that they were baptized. And it, I mean, it was family coming together. I mean, my mother had flown in from Michigan for the baptism as well. And my, my niece, uh, Kylie, was there. So it was, a, it was an experience where we could have the whole family, both sides, actually part of it. Um, and I think that's what made it even more special. I mean, it wasn't just my, my birthday. It was, uh, it was more importantly their rebirth day. I mean, and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and our whole family was able to be together to experience it. Think about where they began. Think about where they are. And what made that good thing possible was God's grace. That became real in the heart of Ron and Nancy and that allowed them to give grace to Maureen and to ask for her forgiveness as well. It's grace that makes life good. Any chance you need something in your life to change, some relationship, some dynamic, any chance that you need God to give you grace so you can forgive, you can let go, so you can start over, so you don't have to be right, you don't have to be proven correct just so the slate can be wiped clean and some little bit of the world, the part that you're in, can be right again. I'm going to pray for us, and if you're here and you need to receive Christ and be forgiven, you need that grace in your life, I'll pray for you. If you're here and you're carrying something heavy and you need to be freed of that by God's grace, I'll pray for that. And if you're here and you need an ability to give grace to others so that your world can become right, can become good. I'll pray for that as well. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for Easter. We thank you that the message of Easter is that you are alive, you are at work, that you are still performing miracles, bringing hope, changing lives, that there is nothing that can defeat your plans for us if we come to you with faith and humility. Lord, I pray for those who are here this morning and they came in feeling like, I've got this, I don't need anything, or they came in feeling, I'm so unworthy, God couldn't possibly love me or forgive me. Lord, take that from us. If this is your prayer, pray it along with me. Lord, I have been on the wrong path. Somehow I've gotten lost in life, and I'm sorry that I've walked away from you. I'm sorry for the things I've done. I'm sorry for so many of the things that I have given myself to. Lord, some I knew were wrong. Others, I just did, trying to find my way. But I now want to come to you. I want to be forgiven. I humble myself. I I don't have this. I want you to have this. I want you to have me. Because I need, I need a relationship with you. And I dare to trust in your grace. So... I receive the gift of your son, Jesus. Forgive my sins, cleanse my heart, send your spirit to live within me. Lord, I want to be yours. Now, if that's your prayer, just say, Lord, that's me. That's my prayer. And God will hear it. He will make it real. He will forgive your sins. He will give you grace. He will give you a new life that begins today. Lord, I pray for those of us who carried something in that's been weighing us down. And I pray this prayer, and if that's you, pray along with me. God, this burden that I've carried, I've held on to it, but now I've discovered it's holding on to me. I don't have it, it has me. And God, I wanna be free, and I've come to believe that I cannot get free of this on my own, but I believe that you who once moved a stone so that Jesus could come to life, you can come and take this stone that is within my soul, you can remove it, you can bring me back to life. Lord God, 
by your grace come into my life, change my spirit, change my heart, change my life from the inside out. I wanna be a different person. I wanna live a new life. Come and do for me what I cannot do for myself. If that's your prayer, let God know and name that thing that you want him to take from you. And finally, Lord, there's some of us here and our world's become a mess. Our relationships have become broken. And we're tired of figuring out how it happened or who's at fault. We don't need to be proven right anymore. We just see that doesn't lead to life. It doesn't lead to peace. It doesn't lead to, to something better. So Lord, we pray now, make this your prayer. Lord, give me grace that I can forgive. Give me grace that I can let go. Give me grace that I can love. Give me grace if I need to, to make a phone call. I want my little girl back. I want my son back. I want my family back. I want my marriage back. Show me what I need to do. Give me the grace to do that. And I will trust you with the rest. God, hear our prayers for we pray it in the name of Jesus. Well, um, you know, it just so happens that the Van Morks are right here. I'm going to embarrass them. We're going to get them to stand. I'm going to tell them that we love them, but we're going to applaud Jesus. So let's, uh, Danny, give us just a little bit of light. And you guys, I know this is terrible. Y'all stand up, but we love you. All right. Yay, Jesus. Will you stand and join me as we respond and worship this morning?